In a poem by St. Teresa of Avila, she proclaims, I am not moved, my God, to love thee by the heaven thou hast promised me, nor am I moved by fear of hell to cease for that reason to offend thee. Thou art what moves me, Lord. It moves me to see thee nailed to a cross and scorned. St. Teresa of Avila's words were the highest expression of a disinterested love, for she loved our Lord ardently without any motivation by personal benefit. However, until we achieve that degree of sanctity, we need to be reminded of the pains of hell to move us along the path of holiness. That's why hearing about all the horrors in St. John Bosco's mystical dream of hell is a gift from God that we should appreciate and take advantage of. He didn't have to give us a glimpse of the afterlife, but revealed it to Don Bosco because he loves us. Listening to this entire dream should be done calmly and with complete confidence in God, but not forgetting that God is letting you hear this story so you can repent and suffer for your sins in this life rather than burn in the next. And so we begin our four-part series on Don Bosco's vision of hell. Buckle up. You're watching The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Don Bosco resumed narrating his dreams on Sunday night, May 3, 1868, the feast of St. Joseph's patronage. He mounted the podium and said, I have another dream to tell you which, in a way, completes the ones I told you last Thursday and Friday, and they left me totally exhausted. Call them dreams, call them anything you wish, but as you know, on the night of April 17th, a frightening toad seemed ready to swallow me alive. When it disappeared, a voice said to me, Why don't you tell them? I turned and saw a distinguished person standing next to my bed. Feeling reproached by my silence, I asked, What should I tell our boys? Tell them what you saw and heard in your latest dreams, and things you will know which will be revealed to you tomorrow night. Then he vanished. I spent the entire next day concerned about the miserable night in store for me. When evening came, unwilling to go to bed, I sat at my desk, leafing through books until midnight. I was horrified at the mere thought of having more nightmares. Finally, with great effort, I went to bed. Afraid of going to sleep, and starting to dream immediately, I set my pillow upright against the headboard and practically sat up, but I was so exhausted that I soon fell asleep. The same person from the night before immediately appeared. Don Bosco often called him the man with the cap, or Beretta. Get up and follow me, he commanded. For heaven's sake, I protested. Leave me alone. I'm exhausted. A toothache has tormented me for many days, and I need to rest. I've had awful nightmares that have completely worn me out. So I said, because this person's apparition always brought me trouble. He answered, Get up. You have no time to waste. I got up and followed him, asking, where are you taking me? Come and you'll see. He led me to a vast, lifeless desert without a soul, tree, or brook. Its yellow and dried-up vegetation offered a sad spectacle. I had no idea where I was or what I had to do. I even lost sight of my guide for a moment and feared that I was lost. Father Rua, Father Franquesia, and the others were out of sight. I sighed in relief when I finally saw my friend coming toward me. Where am I? I asked. Come with me and you'll see. All right. I followed him in silence, but after a long and dismal walk, I began to worry whether I would ever manage to cross that vast plain with my toothache and swollen legs. However, I suddenly saw a road ahead. Where to now? I asked. This way, he answered. We set out on that beautiful, wide, and neatly paved road, reminiscent of the verse from the book of Sirach. The way of sinners is smooth stones, 
and at their end are hell and darkness and pain. The road was lined on both sides with magnificent green hedges dotted with gorgeous flowers. Roses sprung everywhere through the leaves. At first glance, this road was level and comfortable, and I unsuspectingly ventured upon it. However, I soon noticed that it, almost imperceptibly, kept sloping downward. While it didn't look steep, I was moving so swiftly that I felt as if I was effortlessly airborne. I was really gliding and hardly using my feet. It suddenly dawned on me that the return trip would be very long and arduous, so I asked, How shall we get back to the oratory? Don't worry. The Lord Almighty wants you to go. Your guide will know how to lead you back, he answered. The road kept sloping downward. As we went on our way, flanked by roses and other flowers, I realized that I was being followed by the oratory boys and large crowds of others I had never met. I somehow found myself in their midst. Looking at them, I noticed how one or the other would drop to the ground and be dragged by an unseen force toward a scary, distant slope that descended into a furnace. What's making these boys fall? I asked. Take a closer look, he replied. I got closer and saw traps everywhere, reminding me of Psalm 139. Funes extenderunt in laquium, juxta iter scandalum posuerunt. They have spread cords for a net, by the wayside they have laid snares for me. Some were close to the ground, others at eye level, but all were well concealed. Many boys, unaware of the danger, got caught and tripped. They fell to the ground with their legs in the air, and as soon as they managed to get up, they ran straight down the road toward the abyss. Some got trapped by the head, others by the neck, hand, arms, legs, or sides, and were pulled down immediately. The ground traps were as fine as spiders' webs and barely visible. While seemingly very flimsy and harmless, every boy they caught fell to the ground. The guide, seeing my astonishment, asked, Do you know what this is? It's only some filmy fiber, I answered. He added, It's nothing but plain human respect. However, seeing many boys caught in those traps, I asked, Why do so many get caught in this net? Who's pulling them down? He responded, Get closer and you'll see. I watched a bit and said, I don't see anything. Look closer, he insisted. I picked up one of the traps, pulled on it, and immediately felt some resistance. I pulled harder but felt I was being pulled down instead of drawing the thread closer. Unable to resist, I soon found myself at the entrance of a frightening cave. I stopped unwilling to venture into that deep cavern, and started pulling the thread toward me once again. It only gave a little through a strenuous effort on my part. After much tugging, a huge and ugly monster appeared, clutching a rope to which all those traps were tied. It was he who instantly dragged down anyone getting caught in them. I said to myself, "'There is no way I can overcome this ugly monster,' I'll certainly lose. I'd better fight him with the sign of the cross and ejaculations. As I went back to my guide, he said, Now you know who it is, don't you? For sure. It's the devil himself setting traps to drag my boys into hell. I carefully checked many traps and saw that each bore a title. Pride, disobedience, envy, sixth commandment, theft, gluttony, sloth, anger, and so on. I stepped back a bit to see which ones trapped the greater number of boys. I found that the most dangerous were impurity, disobedience, and pride, which indeed were linked together. Several other traps did great harm, but not as much as the first two. I kept watching and noticed that many boys ran faster than others. I asked, why so much haste? They are being dragged by the snare of human respect.
Looking more closely, I saw knives scattered here and there among the traps. A providential hand put them there for souls to cut themselves free. The bigger knife was to be used against the trap of pride and symbolized meditation. Other knives, not quite as big, symbolized well-made spiritual reading. There were also two swords. One represented devotion to the Blessed Sacrament, especially through frequent Holy Communion, the other devotion to the Blessed Mother. There was also a hammer symbolizing confession. Other knives represented devotion to St. Joseph, St. Aloysius, and other saints. A good number of boys managed to break free or evade capture by these means. In fact, I saw lads walking safely through those traps, either by passing before the trap sprung on them or by making it slip off. Once my guide figured I had observed everything, he made me continue along that rose-hedged road. However, the farther we went, the scarcer the roses became, and long thorns began to show up. Soon there were no more roses. The hedges became thorny, leafless, and sun-scorched. Dead branches from the bushes lay along the road, littering it with thorns and making it impassable. We came to a ravine whose steep sides hid what lay beyond. Still sloping downward, the road became ever more terrifying, rutted and strewn with rocks and boulders. I lost track of all my boys, most of whom had left this treacherous road and taken other paths. As I kept going, the further I advanced, the more arduous and steep the descent became. I tumbled and fell several times, lying or sitting down until I could catch my breath. From time to time, my guide supported me or helped me to rise. My joints seemed to give away at every step. I thought my shin bones would snap and said to my guide, panting, My friend, I can no longer stand on my legs. It's impossible for me to keep going. He said nothing and continued walking. I felt encouraged and followed until he saw me soaked in sweat and thoroughly exhausted. He then mercifully led me to a little clearing alongside the road. I sat down, took a deep breath, and felt better. From there I looked at the road I had traveled. It looked very steep, jagged, and strewn with loose stones. However, what lay ahead seemed so much worse that I closed my eyes in horror, pleading, Let's go back. How can we ever get back to the oratory if we go any farther? I'll never make it back up this slope. My guide sternly answered, Do you want me to leave you here now that we have come so far? At this threat I wailed, How can I return or go ahead without your help? Then follow me, he said. I rose, and we continued our descent. The road now became so frightfully steep that it was almost impossible to stand erect. Then an enormous building loomed into sight at the bottom of this precipice, at the entrance of a dark valley. Its towering portal was tightly locked and faced our road. When we got to the bottom of the abyss, I was smothered by suffocating heat while a greasy, green-tinted smoke rose with flashes of scarlet flames from behind those enormous walls which loomed higher than a mountain. I asked my guide, Where are we? What is this? Read the inscription on that portal, and you'll know, he answered. I looked up and read, Ubi non est redemptio, the place of no reprieve. I realized that we were at the gates of hell. The guide led me around the walls of this horrible place. At regular distances, bronze portals like the first overlooked precipitous descents. Each had an inscription such as these two from the Gospel of Matthew, Deshedite maledicti, in ignem eternum qui paratus est diablo et angelis eius. Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. Omnis arbor 
quae non facit fructum bonum exciditor et in ignem mitetor. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I took my notebook to copy them, but my guide said, Stop, what are you doing? I am copying these inscriptions. He answered, There is no need. They're all in Holy Scripture. You even have some inscribed at your entrances. At that sight, I wanted to turn back and return to the oratory. I took a few steps, but my guide shrugged off my attempt. After going through a huge, steep ravine, we again came to the foot of the precipice facing the first portal. The guide suddenly turned to me, upset and startled, motioning me to step aside. Look out! Terrified, I saw in the distance someone racing down the path at breakneck speed. As he got closer, I saw it was one of my boys. His disheveled hair partly stood upright on his head and was partly tossed back by the wind. His arms were outstretched as if thrashing on the water to stay afloat. He wanted to stop, but couldn't. He fell even faster as he tripped on the protruding stones. I shouted, holding out my hands in a vain effort to restrain him. Let's help him! Let's stop him! The guide said, leave him alone. Why can't I stop him? Don't you know how terrible God's vengeance is? Do you think you could stop someone fleeing from his burning wrath? Meanwhile, the youth turned his fiery gaze backward to see if God's wrath was still pursuing him. He then tumbled down the ravine and crashed against the bronze portal as if he could find no better refuge in his flight. I asked, why was he looking backward in terror? Because God's wrath pierces all gates of hell to torment him, even in the midst of fire. The portal sprang wide open with a roar as the boy crashed into it. Instantly a thousand inner portals opened, clanging as if struck by a body propelled by an invisible, violent, and irresistible wind. Although these bronze doors were a considerable distance from each other, as the doors remained momentarily open, I saw far into the distance something like furnace jaws spouting fiery balls as the young man hurtled into it. The portals then clanged shut as swiftly as they had opened. I again took my notebook and tried to jot down the name of that unfortunate lad but the guide held my arm, saying, Wait, and watch again. As I watched, another three of our boys rolled down, one behind the other, like boulders, screaming in terror with arms outstretched. I recognized the three as they crashed against the portal. It sprang open in a split second, and so did the other thousand. As the three lads were sucked into that endless corridor, I heard a drawn-out, fading, infernal echo, and the portals clanged shut. Many other boys came tumbling down after them from time to time. I saw one unlucky boy pushed down the slope by an evil companion. Others fell alone, or with other boys, arm in arm or side by side. Each bore the name of his sin on his forehead. I kept calling them as they hurtled down, but they didn't hear me. The portals again opened thunderously and slammed shut with a rumble. A deadly silence ensued. My guide exclaimed, Here you have the causes for so many lost souls, bad companions, bad books, and bad habits. The traps I saw earlier indeed dragged the boys to ruin. Seeing so many of them lost, I cried out with affliction, if so many of our boys end up this way, our educational work is useless. How can we prevent this calamity? The guide responded, This is their present state, and here is where they would come if they were to die now. So let me write their names to warn them and set them back on the path to heaven. Do you really believe some of them would amend if you warned them? Your warning might impress them for a moment, but they will soon forget it, saying, It was just a dream. 
and they'll do worse than before. Others, seeing they have been unmasked, will frequent the sacraments, but not in an uprightly spontaneous nor meritorious way. Still others will go to confession because of a momentary fear of hell, but will remain attached to sin. Then there's no way to save these poor wretches? Please tell me what I can do for them. They have superiors? Let them obey. They have rules? Let them observe them. They have the sacraments? Let them receive them. At that point, a new group of boys came hurtling down, and the portals momentarily opened, and the guide said to me, Come inside with me. I pulled back in horror. I couldn't wait to rush back to the oratory to warn the boys, lest others might be lost. But my guide insisted, Come and you will learn much. But first tell me, do you want to go alone or with me? He asked this to make me realize that I lacked strength and thus needed his friendly assistance. I replied, Alone into that horrible place? How could I ever find my way out without your help? A thought then dawned on me that aroused my courage. One must be judged before he is condemned to hell, and I haven't been judged yet. So I resolutely exclaimed, Let's go. We entered that narrow, horrible corridor with lightning speed. A threatening inscription shone eerily over each of the inner gateways. The last one opened into a vast and grim courtyard with a large and ominous entrance at the far end. Above it stood this inscription, Ibunt impi in ignem eternum, and these the wicked shall go into everlasting fire a verse from the Gospel of Matthew. All walls were similarly inscribed. I asked my guide permission to read them, which he granted. I looked at the Latin inscriptions and started reading one after the next. Translated, they read, I will give fire into their flesh that they may burn forever. The book of Judith. The smoke of their torments goes up forever and ever, They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The Book of the Apocalypse. There is no peace to the wicked. The Book of Isaiah. Hear all kinds of torments forever and ever. Hear disorder and everlasting horror dwell. The Book of Job. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of Matthew. As I moved from one inscription to another, My guide, who stood in the center of the courtyard, came up to me, saying, From here on, no one may have a helpful companion, a comforting friend, a loving heart, a compassionate glance, or a benevolent word. We've crossed the line. Would you just want to see these things, or experience them yourself? I just want to see, I answered. Then come with me, my friend added. Taking me by the hand, he stepped through that gate into a corridor at whose far end stood an observation deck closed by a huge crystal pane from floor to ceiling. As I crossed its threshold, I felt untold terror and dared not take another step. I saw ahead of me something like an immense cave which gradually disappeared into deep recesses in the bowels of the mountain. Everything was ablaze but not with an earthly fire, with leaping tongues of flames. The cave's walls, ceiling, floor, iron, stones, wood, and coal were glowing white at temperatures of thousands of degrees. However, the fire neither incinerated nor consumed anything. I cannot find words to describe this frightening cave. All I can think of is the verse from Isaiah, For in Topeth there has been prepared beforehand a pit deep and wide with straw and wood in plenty. The breath of Yahweh, like a stream of brimstone, will set fire to it. As I stood stunned looking all around, a boy dashed out of a gate screaming at the top of his lungs as if falling into a lake of liquid bronze. He plunged into the center of the cave and immediately became incandescent and motionless. 
as his dying wail echoed in the distance. Struck with terror, I stared at him for a moment. He seemed to be one of my oratory boys. I asked my guide, Isn't he so-and-so? He responded, Yes, indeed. But why is he so still and incandescent, but doesn't burn out? He replied, You have chosen to see, so don't speak now, but watch, and you'll see. Furthermore, omnis enim igne salietor et omnis victima sali salietor. Everyone shall be salted with fire. Every victim shall be salted. Which I remembered was a verse from the Gospel of Mark. I looked again and saw another lad hurtling down into the cave at high speed. He, too, was from the oratory and remained just as he fell. He, too, emitted a heart-rending shriek that blended in with the last echoes of the scream from the youth before him. Several other boys kept falling in increasing numbers, also screaming and becoming motionless and incandescent. I observed that the first seemed frozen with one hand and one foot raised into the air. The second lad seemed almost bent in two and stuck to the floor. Many had their feet in the air, others their face on the ground. Still others remained in various positions, sitting or lying down, standing, kneeling, hands clutched in their hair. In short, the scene resembled a large statutory group of youngsters cast into ever more painful positions. Other lads fell into that same furnace. Some I knew, others I never met. I recalled that the book of Ecclesiastes says something to the effect that as you fall into hell, so you will forever remain. Lignum in quocumque loco cecciderunt, ibi exit. Where the tree falls, there it shall lie. Even more afraid, I asked my guide, do these boys know where they're going when they come hurtling into this cave? Of course they do. They were warned a thousand times, but still chose to rush into the fire because they neither hated sin nor wanted to give it up. They despised and rejected God's merciful and continuing invitations to do penance, provoked divine justice, persecutes, and hounds them so that they can't stop until they get here. Oh, how afflicted these poor boys must feel, knowing they no longer have any hope, I exclaimed. My guide answered, If you want to know their inner frenzy and fury, draw closer. I took a few steps toward the window and saw many of those wretches savagely hitting one another like rabid dogs. Others were clawing their own faces and hands, tearing their own flesh, and spitefully throwing it about. At that point, the whole ceiling of the cave became as transparent as crystal and unveiled a patch of heaven and their radiant companions, saved forever. Fuming and panting with envy, the poor wretches burned with rage because they once mocked the just, as in Psalm 111, The wicked shall see and shall be angry. He shall gnash his teeth and pine away. I asked my guide, Why do I hear no voices? Draw closer, he shouted. Pressing my ear to the crystal window, I heard some screaming, sobbing, and writhing. Others blasphemed and insulted the saints. It was a shrill and confused tumult of voices and cries, so I asked my friend, What are they saying? What are they shouting? He answered, When they remember the happy lot of their good companions, they're forced to admit, as it says in a verse from the Book of Wisdom, Fools that we were! Their lives we deemed madness, and their deaths dishonored. See how they are accounted among the sons of God? Their lot is with the saints. We then have strayed from the way of the truth. That's why they cry out, We had our fill of the ways of mischief and ruin. We journeyed through impassable deserts, but the way of the Lord we knew not. What did our pride avail us? All those things passed like a shadow. Such are the mournful chants which shall echo here throughout eternity, 
But their shouts, efforts, and cries are all in vain. Omnis dolor iruet super eos. All evils will fall upon them, as it says in the book of Job. Here time is no more. Here is only eternity. A thought suddenly struck me as I, terrified, viewed the condition of many of my boys. How can all these boys here be damned? Last night they were still alive at the oratory. My friend answered, The boys you see here are all dead to God's grace. They would be damned if they died now or persisted in their ways. But let's not waste our time. Let's move on. He led me away from that spot and down through a corridor into a deep cavern. Above its entrance were two Latin verses, the first from the Book of Wisdom and the second from the book of Judith. Their worm shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched. And he will give fire and worms into their flesh, that they may burn and may feel forever. This showed how atrocious was the remorse of those who had been pupils in our schools, how tormented they were upon remembering each unforgiven sin and its just punishment, the countless and even extraordinary means available to mend their ways, persevere in virtue, and earn paradise, and their lack of correspondence to the many graces received from the Blessed Virgin Mary. Oh, how horrible to think they could have saved their souls so easily, but are now irredeemably lost, and to remember the many good resolutions they made but never kept. Indeed, hell is paved with good intentions as the proverb says. Again I saw in this profound cavern the oratory boys who had fallen into the fiery furnace. Some of them are listening to me right now. Others are former pupils or even strangers. As I got closer to them, I noticed they were covered with worms and disgusting animals that gnawed at their hearts, eyes, hands, legs, and whole bodies with indescribable fury. They were motionless, subject to every torment, and unable to defend themselves. I drew closer, hoping to speak with them and console them or or hear something from them, but no one spoke or looked at me. I asked my guide why that was. He explained that the damned no longer have any freedom. Each must fully endure God's punishment with no reprieve whatsoever. He added, Now you too must enter the fiery region you've seen. Oh no, I objected, terrified. One must be judged before going to hell, and I haven't been judged yet, so I don't want to go to hell. He said, Tell me what you'd rather do. Visit hell and save your boys, or stay out and leave them in terrible agony. I was stunned for a moment, and then answered, I love my boys and want to save them all, but... Isn't there some way to avoid them and I going in there? He said, Yes, there is a way, but you must do everything you can. With a sigh of relief, I said to myself, I don't mind working hard as long as I can rescue these dear sons from such torments. Come inside then, my friend went on, and see how our good, almighty God lovingly provides a thousand means for guiding your boys to penance, and saving them from everlasting death. He took my hand and led me into the cave. As I entered, I was suddenly transported into a magnificent hall with crystal doors and curtains covering more entrances to the cavern. Above one door, I read this inscription, The Sixth Commandment. My guide pointed to it, exclaiming, Transgressions of this commandment have caused the eternal ruin of many youths. But didn't they go to confession? They did, but they omitted or insufficiently confessed sins against the beautiful virtue of purity by saying, for example, that they had committed those sins two or three times when it was actually four or five. Other boys may have committed that sin only once in their childhood, but were ashamed to confess it or did so insufficiently. Still others were not really sorry nor made a sincere resolution to avoid it in the future. 
Some, instead of examining their conscience, even spent time trying to figure out how best to deceive their confessor. He who dies in this state of mind chooses to be among the damned and is doomed for all eternity. Only those truly repentant who die hoping for eternal salvation will be forever happy. Now do you want to see why God's mercy has brought you here? My guide lifted the curtain, and I saw a group of oratory boys, all known to me, who were there because of this sin. Some whose conduct seems to be good were among them. I asked, Will you at least now let me write their names to warn them individually? He answered, It's not necessary. What then do you suggest I tell them? Always preach against immodesty. A generic warning is enough, but remember that some will promise to amend if you admonish them individually, but will not always do so in earnest. God's grace is needed to have a firm resolution, and it will not be denied to your boys if they pray. God manifests his power especially by being merciful and forgiving. On your part, pray and make sacrifices. Let them listen to your admonitions and consult their conscience, which will tell them what to do. After we spent a half hour discussing the requisites to make a good confession, my guide exclaimed several times in a loud voice, Avertere! Avertere! What do you mean by that? I asked. Change your life. Stunned, I bowed my head as if about to withdraw, but he held me back and said, You haven't seen everything yet. He turned and lifted another curtain with this inscription that was a verse taken from the first epistle to Timothy. Qui volunt divites fiere, incidunt in tentationum et laquium diaboli. Those who long to be rich fall prey to temptation and the snares of the devil. I countered, this doesn't apply to my boys because they're as poor as I am. We neither are nor want to be rich. It doesn't cross our minds. However, as the curtain was lifted, I saw a group of boys all known to me. Like those I had seen earlier, they were in pain. My guide said, pointing to them, As you can see, the inscription does apply to your boys. How so? Can you explain? I asked. He said, For example, some of your boys are attached to material possessions, so their love of God is lessened, and they sin against charity, piety, and meekness. The mere desire for riches can corrupt one's heart, especially if that desire violates the virtue of justice. While your boys are poor, remember that greed and idleness are evil counselors. One of your boys has committed substantial thefts in his town and is not thinking of making restitution, even though he could do so. Others try to break into the pantry or the prefect's or purveyor's office, rummage in their colleagues' trunks for food, money, or other objects, steal stationery and books. After naming these and other boys, he said, Some are here for having stolen clothing items, linen, blankets, and coats from the oratory wardrobe to send them home. Others for serious damage willfully done. Still others for not returning what they had borrowed or for keeping money supposed to be handed over to their superior. Then he concluded, Now that you know who they are, advise them to reject vain and harmful desires, to obey God's law, and to jealously safeguard their good name. Otherwise, greed will lead them to baleful excesses and plunge them into sorrow, death, and damnation. I couldn't understand why infractions the boys thought so little of led to such dreadful punishments. My guide interrupted my thoughts. Remember what you were told when seeing the spoiled grapes on the vine. He thus lifted another curtain, hiding many of our oratory boys. I instantly recognized them all. An inscription on the curtain read, Radix omnium malorum, the root of all evils. Then he asked me, Do you know what this means? What sin is it? To me, it would seem like pride. No, he answered. But I've always heard that pride is the root of all evil. Generally speaking, it is. 
But do you know the particular fault that led Adam and Eve to commit the first sin and which led to their being driven away from the earthly paradise? Disobedience? Yes, precisely. Disobedience is the root of all evil. What should I tell my boys about this point? Listen carefully. The boys you see here are preparing a tearful end for themselves by being disobedient. So-and-so and so-and-so, and so, who you think went to bed, leave the dormitory in the wee hours to roam about the playground. Disobeying orders, they go into dangerous construction areas and up scaffolds, endangering their lives. Others go to church but misbehave, ignoring the rules. They daydream or cause disturbances instead of praying. Some find a comfortable position to doze off during services, while others only make believe they're going to church but stay away. Woe to those who neglect prayer. They who do not pray doom themselves. Some boys are here because they read frivolous or even forbidden books instead of singing hymns or reciting the little office of the Blessed Virgin. He mentioned other serious disciplinary disorders. I was deeply moved when he finished and looked him in the eye, asking, Can I mention all this to my boys? You can surely tell them all you remember. What advice should I give them to save them from such a catastrophe? Keep insisting that they will be saved by obeying God, the church, their parents, and superiors, even in small things. Any other instructions? Warn them against idleness, which led David to sin, and to keep always busy to deny the devil any opportunity to tempt them. I bowed my head, and I promised I would do so. I was so dismayed that I could only say, Thank you for being so charitable to me, and please help me get out of here. He said, Come with me. To encourage me, he took my hand and held me up as I could barely keep standing. We left that hall and quickly went back through that horrible courtyard and the long entrance corridor. As soon as we stepped across the last bronze portal, he turned to me and said, Now that you have seen the torments that others suffer, you too must experience a bit of hell. No, no, I cried, terrified. He insisted, but I kept refusing. Fear not, he said. Just touch this wall. I had lacked the courage to do it and tried to flee, but he held me back, insisting, Try it. He gripped my arm firmly and pulled me to the wall, commanding, Touch it at least once so you can say you saw and touched the walls of eternal torments. That way you will be able to understand what the last wall must be like if this first wall is so unbearable. Do you see this wall? I carefully looked at the wall, which seemed incredibly thick. He continued, There are a thousand walls between this one and the real hellfire of hell. It is surrounded by one thousand walls, each a thousand meters thick and equally distant from the next. Each measure is a thousand miles, so this wall stands millions of miles from hell's real fire. It is but a remote suburb of hell proper. I instinctively pulled back as he said that, but he seized my hand, opened it, and pressed it against the stone of that first of a thousand walls. I felt such a burning pain that I jumped back with a loud scream. I immediately found myself sitting up in bed with a burning hand, which I kept rubbing to ease the pain. I noticed it was really swollen as I got up in the morning. Just that dream of having my hand pressed against the wall felt so real that the skin of my palm later peeled off. Note that I have not described these things in all their horror as I saw them, as they impressed me so as not to frighten you too much. As we know, our Lord always used symbols to portray hell because we wouldn't have understood him if he described it as it really is. No mortal can understand these things. The Lord knows and reveals them to whoever he wants. Still upset by this frightening dream, I was unable to fall asleep over the next several nights. I only have given you a short summary of extremely long dreams. 
Later, I'll tell you about human respect, the sixth and seventh commandments, and pride. I'll explain these dreams without more ado because they're fully according to the Holy Scriptures and are only a commentary on their teachings concerning these matters. I told you a few things some nights ago, but whenever I have a chance, I'll tell you the rest and explain it. And with that, Don Bosco descended from the podium. As promised, Don Bosco later narrated a summarized version of this dream to the boys at Mirabello and Lonzo. In doing so, he introduced variations, but made no substantial changes. The true Catholic can be serene, joyous, or even lively. He can be whatever is permissible by the commandments, but he must have a permanent foundation of seriousness. Look at St. John Bosco's picture. We see charity, tranquility, and serenity, but above all, we see a profound seriousness. But why? Because everything in life is serious, and we're dealing with the gravest and most serious thing that exists every day of our lives, our eternal destiny. Above all, for the Catholic, there is a celestial medicine for carrying the cross of seriousness, expressed in the ineffable words, Salve Regina, Hail Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Pray to Our Lady and make her smile. One smile from her gives us the strength for a hundred years of seriousness. Thank you all so much for watching, and please consider helping me with a small monthly donation by following the link in the description below so that I can continue making videos and reach more people with the precious gift of the stories of St. John Bosco's life. God bless you, and may Our Lady keep you.